everybody, and welcome to this episode of the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry Podcast, where today we're going to be, I think, going over some emails today. And in one of the emails we're going to go over, we are going to talk about calling ourselves a poet and what that actually means. And then in another one, we're going to talk about um, publishing Kind of the differences between publishing chapbooks and publishing ebooks and paperback books and things like that. So, this will be um, kind of an exciting little episode here with tons of different stuff that we'll be hitting. Um, but what I do want to say first, I had an idea of something and then immediately disproven to my original point. So, let me say this I got quite a few messages as I thought I would um, about the episode 60 uh, Case Against Versecraft. Shockingly the responses I got weren't nearly as negative as I thought they were going to be. I was really worried about how some people would take it. I felt pretty good about that. But I do want to say something about this and my takes on it because I realized something. I realized how powerful generalization can be. Okay. One of the comments I got was asking me, who are all of these formalists that say blankety blank, blank, blank. And so I want to say that when I say formalists, okay, And I'm like, and the formalists say, blah, 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 blah. Please know that I am not in any means speaking for every formalist out there. Okay. I am only speaking about the formalists that I know and who I have talked to and who have said things like these things that I'm saying. And I think that's kind of crucial to like, let you guys know, even though I feel like a couple times in that episode, I tried to make it clear. This is not every formalist. That acts like this. Some do these things and some don't. And that's fine. But the funny thing is, right after this happened, somebody sent me a video interview with Stephen Fry. And told me to watch this and all this other stuff. Um, And in watching it, Stephen Fry ended up saying a bunch of the things that I said formalist poets say, okay? The dude who was interviewing him, and he was saying a bunch of the stuff that I said formalists say. Even though what I say is a generalization, I know enough about how formalists think that even formalists that I don't know halfway around the world say the same things that I said formalists say. So um, I felt bad about some of the things I said and then didn't feel so bad anymore. So what I want to kind of get at with this is that generalization is usually a bad thing to do, especially when you're making an argument for something. But on the other side of that coin, it's called generalization for a reason. That's it. That's the disclaimer at the beginning of this shizno. This is going to go live on Wednesday. So I do want to kind of promote that I'm doing another um, week-long Poetic Anarchy free workshop, and it's going on right now. Um, I just finished day two. So day one was all about giving yourself permission. Day two, which is today as of recording this, was about writing with ease. And tomorrow, don't know exactly what we're going to be going over tomorrow, which will be today as you're hearing this, but it'll probably be about creating bite-sized art. But anyway, so through this whole thing, it's going to culminate on Friday with us doing my Endless Poem Workshop, where you can write an entire chat book in one sitting. Okay? So... If that sounds intriguing to you, please show up. Um, It's every day this week at 1 p.m. Pacific time. 
And if you can't watch it live, there will be a replay. So hopefully I'll remember to put the playlist in the description of this video. That'd probably be a good way to go about it. It was really cool. Today was great. And I've been getting tons of great poems from people. And I'm just kind of digging it. So make sure you do that. Also, we are 11 days away from the end of Your Mom. Of the crowdfunding campaign. And we are only at about 30%, roughly. Okay? So we have um, nine backers at $450. Okay? We need to amp this up, people. Your mom needs you to put the dollars in her thong. Okay? So let's make this happen. God, the quicker this happens, the less I'm going to have to keep saying your mom about stuff and putting horrible images in your head. Ugh, talk about extortion. Now what we are going to do, we're going to do the thing that we do. Oh, oh my gosh, guys. I have such good news. I have such good news. As of today, I think the podcast is available everywhere. It's on Amazon. So Audible and stuff like that. It's up on iHeartRadio. It's on Stitcher. It's on Pandora. I think it's on Sirius. Um, it's on the Google Android um, podcast store shop thing. And then um, when I Googled it, because one of the things I was reading say, make sure you Google and see if it's popping up everywhere. Dude, there are like 8 million fucking like podcast sites that I did not even know existed that um, are carrying the feed. So... This show's fucking everywhere, all right? So I finally did it. And honestly, it seriously took me, I think, maybe 15, 16 minutes to make sure that the podcast is available everywhere. So what do you know? So it did say some of the things might take a couple days for it to actually show up. But it is everywhere now. So um, by the time you hear this, hopefully... It'll be there. But if you're already hearing this, you're already getting your podcast somewhere cool. So what the fuck does it matter? <sighs> I just feel like I accomplished a lot today, guys. That's it. Accomplishing, accomplishing. So go give this podcast five stars. And wherever you listen to podcasts, wherever you review podcasts, wherever ghetto birds fly high, give this podcast the best score you can because you know it's what the right thing to fucking do perfect everyone's good bob's your uncle fanny's your aunt um lester's your uncle you know it's all good so really quick I'm going to give a big shout out to all the people who make the show possible. And again, I know a lot of you fast forward through this. That makes you guys assholes. Listen to the names of the people who make this show possible. So broke asses like you could sit and listen to it as the freeloading scum that you are. Okay. So I want to give a big thank you to all those beautiful motherfuckers over on the Patreons. I want to give a big thank you to... Michael, to Deborah, to Cedar, to Harry. Then I want to give a big thank you to all those motherfuckers over on the thank you crew. I want to give a big thank you to Patrick, to Britt, to JH, and to Jan. Thank you guys for making this possible. And now, I want to give a big thank you to all you motherfuckers over there in the Anarchy crew. I want to give a big thank you to Bunny, to Nate, to Mindy, to Thomas. To Shaylin, to Chill Baby, to Tim J, to Tamra, and welcome back, Tim J, Tim Johnston in the house. Thank you for coming back, brother. I appreciate you. And then I also want to give the biggest thank yous of the world to those beautiful motherfuckers over there in the chapbook of the month club the number one chappies i want to give a thank you to chase and to caitlin you guys are fucking awesome and you guys make this world go round whatever that song is i just made it up it's all good so now 
let's get on with the shizno in the mizno. Don't even know what I'm saying now. Motherfucker. Okay. What we are going to do now is we are going to... Um, I'm going to read an email to you here. And this is... A, this kind of... It's one of these things that are sad. But but it's okay. Basically, um, me and Bree, whose email I'm going to read right now, have been trying to set up a time for us to record this podcast where we talk about the stuff that is in this email. But... Because of both of our schedules, me having all my leg problems that I had, and um, Bree's schedule being what Bree's schedule is, we kept like missing each other to the to the point where we were going to sit down and do this. And I'm still going to have Bree on the show at some point. Okay, it's going to happen. But I want to go over this email before it goes back so far that I forget about it. So here we go. Something that's been on my mind for a while is how to reestablish a relationship with writing that feels reasonable and sustainable to me. I've gone back and forth over the years about claiming the title of a writer because my relationship to the craft has waxed and waned forever. I've been writing since I was a kid, was published in middle school, won writing contests and shit, went to an arts high school where I majored in creative writing and then got sick of it because it felt like work. So then I went the technical route in film school and hated that, found my way back to writing via screenwriting and creative nonfiction, moved to LA, got a job as a copywriter, hated writing again because it became work again. I rekindled sporadic love for it via zines and was published in a really dope anthology in 2017. But I never regained consistency. I've always seemed to work in spurts. In the last couple years, I've been exploring what it's like to write just for me and just for fun. And also exploring other creative outlets. Because for so long, I would tell myself... It wasn't worth creating if it wasn't writing. And then Brie goes on talking about the other creative things that they are doing um, right now. Um, Let me see. Also, I never wrote poetry until the last year or two. Uh, Another thing is navigating gnarly health stuff and how that impacts my capacity for writing. Being okay with my craft looking different than what I feel like it's supposed to look like. So that's a lot of stuff to talk about. And um, again, a lot of this was kind of us going back and forth about what to do a podcast on. And the only reason why I feel comfortable um, talking about this now is because me and Bree have been talking so much that I feel like we can talk about a million things. So um, going in on like, what can we ever do a podcast about? Um, There's plenty of stuff that uh, Bree and I can talk about. This is a thing because I feel like a lot of people, and if, again, if you're coming to my writing workshop right now, we went over the last two days talking about how a lot of writers start writing a certain way and start going about it a certain way to the point of burnout, to where, like, They feel like their relationship with writing is not fun anymore and is just work. So there's a lot of stuff in that workshop that I feel like mirrors this conversation a lot. So I'm still going to try to um, talk about this stuff as best as I can without just rehashing everything I, I just did the fucking workshop about. So the easiest answer to this question, okay, which is basically reestablishing a relationship with your writing and being able to claim the title of a writer or claim the title of a poet to where you don't feel stupid doing that the easiest way to do it is to just do it call yourself a writer call yourself a poet what is the thing you're doing are you writing are you writing poems are you writing stories if you're writing poems call yourself a poet if you're writing stories call yourself a writer you know If you're riding a bike, call yourself a bicyclist, okay? 
If you're giving someone tattoos, call yourself a tattoo artist, a tattooist, okay? If you are having a cigarette, call yourself a smoker. If you're drinking some wine, call yourself a drinker. It's really easy to call yourself something. Our society has beat us over the head with genres and labels and all this other stuff. That it is very easy for us to call ourselves whatever the fuck we want. The only way that you would look stupid in calling yourself something is if you didn't do that thing. Like, if I called myself a smoker, and then the doctor says, well, how many cigarettes do you smoke a day? And I go, oh, well, I actually don't. That would sound stupid, okay? But if, like, you're a poet, and I say, well, how often do you write poems? And you're like, oh, all the time. Sometimes, like, one a week, a couple a month, you know? But, you know, sometimes I'll write, like, 20 in a day. You're a poet. Congratulations. You passed. Okay? You can call yourself whatever you want to call yourself as long as you're doing the thing. Like, I wouldn't call yourself a doctor if you are not a doctor. But if you go through school and get your little certificate and start making money because people come into you with their pancreas hanging out and you fix it, you're a fucking doctor. Okay? So it's really easy to call yourself something. The hard part is making yourself believe it because it'll be easy for other people to believe it because you're just telling them. But for you to believe it, you have to have faith in what you're doing. You have to have the same like belief. Now, Bree is an amazingly strong person if you don't know Bree. Okay? So, Bree claims lots of labels, let's say, for all different things. And when Brie does that, Brie is very outspoken about it and very strong about it. So, Brie, what I would say to you right now is you just went through this whole email telling me all the stuff you've done. Okay? Okay. You, you proved it to me. You're a writer. You've been writing poems. You're a poet. Now all you have to do is own it. And you are that thing. Okay? So, now that we got that part out of the way, let's talk about fixing that relationship. Now, with any relationship you have, the best way to make it work for you and to make it good is to work on it. Like if you were in like couples counseling, you know, the therapist would tell you, you know, you guys can do this. You just got to work on it. You know, there has to be intention behind what you do. Okay. So when you sit down and write, you have to do this intentionally. You have to tell yourself that you are intentionally going to create something right now. And if you have to say that out loud before you do it, do that. And then turn on the spigots, you know, and let that water flow out of those fingers. Okay? That's how you do that. And it takes time. In order to rekindle a relationship of any kind, it's not something that just happens. It's something that you work on. Every day. Now, when I say work on, I don't mean it has to be hard. I'm not saying it has to be difficult. It could be very easy. You just have to put the time in. That's it. Okay? What were some other things in here? Oh. Health stuff. Okay? As someone who has gone through some health situations lately... What I would say with this is, I know that when you are feeling like shit, it's hard to like sit down at a computer and start typing or pull out a notebook and get a pen and start writing stuff. But me being me and knowing how much I could, could fucking complain, okay? The one thing I do know I could do is fucking bitch. So, like... When I am at my worst, okay, and I can't fucking type at all, 
and it's just killing me. What I'll do is I'll pick up my phone, hit voice memos, and just fucking spill and just let all of that shit out. Okay? Do that. Create that. Say those words. Say them however you want, however they feel. Say whatever to get all of that out of you. And then later, when you're feeling better, you can go back and type that out. Hell, you can, um, I don't know, like do like a text or a speech to text feature and just copy and paste that text into a document. You know, if you don't want to like sit down and type out all the things you've said, you could try that. Um, that works. With gnarly health stuff, all you got to do is come up with a way to get that down even if it's not very conventional being okay with what my craft with my craft looking different than what i feel like it's supposed to look like that is something that is just a you thing like you have to be able to understand that everything's going to look different you know like some people like when you're painting like when you sit down to paint something like at least when I do I usually have an image in my mind of what I want to paint and then I will paint something and when I'm done with it it looks nothing like the image that I had in my head but what it is is an interpretation of that image okay like my my job as a painter isn't to be a photocopy of the thoughts that I have in my head. My job as a painter is to interpret those thoughts the best way I can in whatever medium I have. So a lot of times you will have an idea for a poem in your head or an idea for a short story in your head. And then in your head, as you're working through it, there's all this stuff in it. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. But when you sit down and type that, a lot of times it's not going to turn out the way it was when you were thinking about it. And that's okay. That's transference. It's always going to be a little bit different. It's almost like playing telephone. Like, you know, when someone would say something and whisper it to the next person, next person, next person. And then it ends up in this different thing through all of these filters. So you are the filter for your mind. And when you're creating, it will turn out different. And that's fine. That's, that's the part of art, you know, which makes it art and not, I don't know, copy and paste, you know. So um, understand that. And um, think about that next time you're creating something, whether it's a floral arrangement, which, by the way, I do have a certificate in through ROP because I was failing Spanish and I needed to graduate. Long story. (sighs) So hopefully that was interesting shit and um, that was helpful. Again, Bree, thank you for the email. And we're going to get you on the show. So we'll keep working on that. Okay, this is going to be a lot of fun. I'm really excited about this. Um, I had a great back and forth here. Um, So I'll get to to the question bit here. I've also been trying out self-publishing short stories as zines lately. Right now, I'm just giving them away for free. But I think at some point, I would like to put them up for sale. Still figuring out how I want to go about all that. You publish a lot of your poetry this way, right? I'd be interested in your thoughts on this versus self-publishing as eBooks or versus just putting stuff online for free. Oh man, oh man, oh man. Oh captain, my captain. This is one of those questions that gets my guess it damp. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm excited. First off, I think everyone should publish their own zine. Um, Especially if it's a zine that has a bunch of different writers in it. Like where you're the editor of a magazine and you're finding stuff that you like, that you're curating, 
and putting out. I think everyone should do this. It's so easy to do. And if you are lucky enough, and when I say lucky enough, all you have to do is actually do it and this will happen. But like the whole like zine and zinester community is so open with helping that like everyone will help out trying to make your publication the best it can be. And it doesn't have to be expensive to put together, you know. Um, like, you could put it together and just give people contributor copies. Um, and, like, depending on how you do it, you could do it for less than a dollar an issue. And then sell them for three to five bucks. Sometimes, depending on how much you put into it, you could sell them for up to ten. You know what I'm saying? So that's always cool. Um, I'm always a big fan of writers and poets putting their own work out, um, especially in like a handmade form. I just love that as like a nerdy fucking dude. Okay. Um, and that's that. Now, What I will say about this other stuff here is this. I'm going to focus this part of this conversation on poetry, since a lot of the people who listen to the show are listening to it for the, the poetry aspect of it. So here's the deal. When I have published poetry as ebooks on um, like Amazon and stuff like that, they do not sell very good, okay? Um, I don't know what it is about ebooks as far as poetry goes, but I haven't been able to find an audience there. I also have not been able to move my print audience to an ebook audience, okay? Now, I keep hearing from people that... Um, ebook poetry is getting really big and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and if there are people out there who are doing well with ebooks and poetry that's fucking awesome when people say it's getting bigger and bigger uh, bigger than zero um, is still bigger so I guess that is true so if you went from selling um, zero to five ebooks a month and now, next month, you're selling six. You know, that is growth. So that's cool. Now, that might sound like I'm being shitty about it, but growth is growth. And if you can have a steady growth, that's all you need. If your numbers are getting bigger each month, keep doing that thing. Because it's working. So, if you are doing ebooks. Keep track of how your growth is. And each month should be getting bigger than the month before it. Okay? And if it's not, you need to look at it and figure out what you are doing wrong. What you could be doing to make things better. And then look back at the months where things were working. And see what happened those months that were working that aren't working now. So if you just like, it could be something as simple as when on the months that you sold the most ebooks, you posted on social media um, 70 times instead of 30 times. You know, like it's, it's not going to take Sherlock Holmes to come in and try to solve this. You can usually figure everything out very, very simply. And when I'm talking about that thing, I, I, this is not just an ebook thing. This could be print books, it could be chat books, it could be zines, it could be whatever. Follow what you're doing, keep track of what you're doing, keep track of your sales, and figure out what works when and why. Okay? It's not a tricky thing to figure out. Okay, and so, honestly, let me throw this out there too. If you are a poet who is doing well with ebooks, or 
just doing anything with ebooks, please write me at I hate Matt Walt gmail.com and let me know how you're doing. And let me know if there are certain times of year that are better than other times, what price points work. All of this information is awesome information. And the more information I get, the more I can do stuff on here that kind of spreads that wealth around. You know what I'm saying? Now, uh, right now, I'm just giving them away for free. Now, what I will say about this is giving stuff away for free is awesome, especially if you make a connection with somebody, okay, and then give it to them. What I do not recommend you do is just walk up to some random person and go, oh, here you go. And they're like, what's this? Who are you? And you're like, oh, I'm so-and-so, and this is my poetry book. And then you're like, okay, bye. And then you walk away, and then they're like, that was fucking weird. And then that ends up dropped on the ground. Okay? So if you are making genuine connections with people, definitely give something away. Especially if you have a bunch of other books that are for sale. If you don't have a bunch of books that are for sale, and this is the only book you have, and you're giving it away for free, there isn't a huge way to retain that person especially if you're not building an email list at the same time so if in your book it has like ways to connect with you um on social media and uh go to this website to sign up for my mailing list so i could send you more stuff okay that's when you do that stuff for free. If you're not doing that, you're just kind of throwing your stuff away and hoping that it will stick to something. But if you don't know who your buyers are, it's kind of impossible to have that be beneficial in any way. Okay? Because if you're giving someone something for free with and then tell them in that thing where they can find more of your stuff, then at least they're going and hopefully they will be a future... Um, fan, a future customer. Okay. But if you don't have that, you're just kind of giving stuff to the void. Okay. And this is another reason why I don't really like Amazon very much because Amazon doesn't give you the information of the people who purchased your products. So, whereas on Etsy, I know who has bought my stuff. On Amazon, I have no fucking idea. I just know I got a sale. Okay. Now, as far as Amazon goes as well, <clears throat> um, my paperback poetry sells a bit better than my ebook poetry. And it also, I have a higher profit margin on the paperback poetry than I do on the ebook poetry. So, even with that, like the paper book sales work better for me as a working poet okay but my chapbook sales dwarf anything i do on amazon for the most part there are some other things i have on amazon like novels and shit that sell relatively well and depending on the time of year sell better than others but as far as poetry goes my chapbooks sell really good on Etsy. And that's not because of Etsy. That's because of me. Like, I get hardly zero traffic from Etsy itself. Like, the sales I get on Etsy are usually generated from me sending people to Etsy. Okay? Which is why I really want to start just selling stuff on my own site. But, with that said... The poetry sells way better than the short story chapbooks do. I do not know if this is because I have built a fan base of poetry readers who dig chapbooks, or if it's because short stories don't sell well in chapbook form or zine form, which I don't think is the case, because when I was doing Weird Mask, Weird Mask sold really well. And when... Um, I was writing Weird Mask and editing Weird Mask. The story chapbooks I would do, or the short story zines I would do, also sold relatively well. They didn't sell as well as Weird Mask, but they sold. My poetry chapbooks 
I guess depending on the theme. There were a couple themes um, in the Weird Mask um, chapbook, or the Weird Mask zines, that sold like fucking gangbusters. Like, it wasn't even funny. Like, um, I was having to do second runs of those, like, really quick. And then other ones that I didn't expect to have a very high um, sales run, I guess. So I would do a lower print run. Those sold out really fucking fast. So um, it's weird. So let me kind of go through. Yeah, I'll go through like a little um, Weird Mask retrospective. So in case you don't know, Weird Mask was the zine I did that was kind of like a pulp influenced um weird fiction um magazine so it was mainly short stories i would also have serials in there too and for the first like four issues i had um i was doing actually it went on way longer than that because i finished the story but i was doing um in the first swing i was doing um, Edgar Rice Burroughs, um, Princess of Mars. I was serializing that within the pages of Weird Mask. So I think it took like nine issues to finish Princess of Mars. But then I started uh, the zine called The Time Zine, which was all public domain um, stories and serials. So I kind of pulled that out of Weird Mask and just started doing that there. But anyway, so the first three issues of Weird Mask had no theme. And they sold okay. Um, when issue three came out, that had um, Lovecraft on the cover, which helped. Um, but also, that came out the same month as a big zine fest that I tabled at. So I ended up selling... Um, like, I sold out of issues one and two. Um, and then that helped sell out issue three. And then I think I did another run of the first issue and um, another run of the third issue. I don't know if I did another run of the second issue. I can't remember. But anyway, so um, that was that. The fourth issue, the theme of it was planetary romance. And again, because I was doing the Edgar Rice Burroughs Princess of Mars. Now, I'm, you're gonna, your mind's going to be blown right here. Planetary romance is not very popular. <laughs> Fucking hell. I should have just called it space opera because um, I think the planetary romance genre, it, it wasn't really about romance, but it, it follows more closely with space opera than it does anything else. So anyway, so that was that. That one didn't sell very good. But issue five and six, this is when I started going um, twice a month. So every two weeks, it was on the 1st and the 15th, a new issue would come out. And this was October. And um, both issues were zombie issues. And the reason why I did this the way I did is because I got so many great submissions for like zombie stories that I wanted all of them. I wanted to put all of them out, but I already had the next two months themes planned out. And so I didn't want to put another zombie book out in November, which in retrospect, I definitely should have done. But anyway, so, um, yeah, so I did the two zombie ones. Those things sold out so fast. Um, I sold out of both of them, like, within that month. I sold out of five that month and six halfway through November. And then I did a small reprint of them because I wasn't sure how many more I would sell. And those still sold good and ended up selling out. So those were amazing. Um, the next issue, I did a lit RPG thing. Did not sell well. Not very good. So then the next one was... Um, and I, I dug be doing this thing where I was going to go twice a month. So, and I think I still have some of the lit RPG ones. I'm not 100%. But I think I remember seeing one of those floating around here somewhere. So I might still have a couple of those. But so the next one was Dysfunctional Families. 
and um, that one had Divine on the cover. And that one, um, that did okay. That sold okay. And I'm out of those. But let's see. And then, but then I did Colts. Oh, yeah. I did Colts with Charles Manson on the cover. And then I did a Christmas issue with um, Joan Collins from uh, Tales from the Crypt. Is that what it was? That Santa horror thing she did on the cover of it? That, that did okay. But then I did uh, sci-fi. Then I did dirty realism. Superstitions. And then I did a Valentine's Day issue. Like a like a romance erotica issue. And that sold out and I couldn't believe it. So that should tell you something. Um, and then I did Transgressive. And then I did Hard Boiled Detective. And then fantasy, like sword and sorcery. And then music, um, back to school, Halloween. Oh, and I forgot the two Cthulhu issues, which were the big sellouts. Um, and then I think that takes us to issue 25, which was the um, kind of best of plus what... I'm looking forward to like in the future with it and then ended up never doing another one. Now the reason why I never did another one is because I wanted to up the game of Weird Mask because they were selling good. So I wanted to make books of them and like big perfect bound books instead of just like the floppy zines of them. When I did this, even though Weird Mask 25 was like a hundred fucking pages plus where no, it was like 120 pages or 130 pages. Whereas most issues of Weird Mask were about 40 pages. Weird Mask 25 did not sell at all as well as all the other Weird Mask issues sold. And I think a lot of it had to do with there is a type of person, like a whole like subculture of people who dig zines and dig that shit. And when I moved away from that and took what I had and moved it away, it was not, like, respected the same way as it was when it was a handmade zine. So, um, I don't know if that is something to think about, but I'll tell you right now, romance and um, Cthulhu and zombies, those things sell. Those things sell. So if you're looking to put a zine together, do that. Another thing, whatever you put on the cover really does like have a lot to do with if it's going to sell or not. So, for instance, putting Lovecraft on a cover sold a lot of copies of that. Putting Divine on a cover sold a lot of copies of that. Putting Charles Manson on a cover sold a lot of copies of that. Um, Bukowski on the cover sold a lot of copies of that. Let me see. I guess the Cthulhu thing and having Cthulhu images on the cover sold a lot too. So there's issues that didn't sell like that the content I don't think really sold it but the covers did. And then like the superstitious one I did um, Jason Voorhees like the hockey mask and that sold out. You know what I'm saying? So I would just say um, even though this is not at all what you fucking asked, um, definitely think about doing a zine. I always want people to do little magazines, too. Always, always, always. Uh, putting things online for free is hard to build an audience off of unless it's something that is easily retweetable, meaning like Instagram or Twitter or something like that. But again, if you're doing that, the things you're writing have to be very short, very small. Because when people read stuff online, they just read it and go past it. Like, it's really hard for something online to stick. Whereas something in your hand, that sticks around. It's a lot easier to have that stick. Um, I already said what I said about poetry ebooks, and maybe it's just the store. Maybe Amazon is the problem here. If you are selling poetry ebooks on other platforms like Smashwords or Draft to Digital or Kobo or Nook or whatever, 
please let me know. I'd love to fucking hear if poetry ebooks sell better outside of Amazon. Um, but yeah, so those are my thoughts on all that. So I'm going to wrap this up. Yes, I hope that was helpful. Um, again, thank you, Francis, for the question. And thank you, Bree, for the question. So let's get into the butt plugs. Butt plugs. Your mom fucking needs your help so bad. We have a long way to go and not many days to get there. So if you haven't decided that you were going to help support your mom and support me, winner of your mom's taught me prize for poetry, what the fuck is wrong with you? Please help. Get over there now. Pick a tier. Pick a perk. There's all sorts of... I'm going to send you my own t-shirts. Not t-shirts that say Matt Wall, but t-shirts that are in my closet. T-shirts you've seen me wear. I'm giving you the shirt off my back. Okay? I'm going to send you books from my fucking bookcase. I might even send you the keys to my car or the keys to someone else's car who's I stole. Okay? So just get over there and do it. Do the thing. Other than that, please, if you are listening to this the week of March 20th, get over to um, the link down below for the playlist of the um, 2023 um, free writing workshop. Get over there. Make sure you're there by Friday so you can take part in the Endless Poem workshop so you can write your own chapbook in one sitting. It's possible. It can happen. I've done it a bunch. Okay? So with all that said, thank you for being awesome. Thank you for being you. Type hard, everybody. And I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. And thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.